In this HVACR training video, I'm going over all the different types of gas furnace components that you can run into when you're servicing gas furnaces out in the field. From 60% efficient furnaces all the way up to say 98% efficient gas furnaces. We're gonna be going over that coming up. So the object of today is to determine where your pain points are for when you're servicing a gas furnace. So we need to know what all the internal components are that you can run into in the field. We're gonna be going over some of the history of gas furnaces and each of the components and how you would troubleshoot them. What you really need to think about is we have a kind of a evolution of gas furnaces over the last 60, 80 years. And you can have just a variety of different components inside. This first example is just kind of the operation of an 80% efficient gas furnace just to get started. This would be a furnace that you would install inside of a building. Those uh, are ones that you'd have outside. Those are called gas furnace package units. On a call for heat, you have to have your, your door switch closed and you're gonna have that call on W on the control board on a normal 80% efficient gas furnace. Here's a wiring diagram for a gas furnace and air conditioning system. And you see that we're running 18.6 thermostat wire and we have our thermostat, we have our gas furnace, and then we have our outdoor condensing unit. White is W and that is for heat. We have Y, that's yellow, and that's for air conditioning. We have R, that's red, and that's power, 24 volts. And we have G, that is green, and that's for the fan. And we have C, and C is your common or your path back in order to power your thermostat. What you are doing inside the thermostat is you are connecting R and W. So once you have 24 volts on the furnace control board, because you remember you have 24 volts on the R on the furnace control board, and you can measure that with a multimeter between R and C. Once you measure on a gas furnace between W and C, and you measure 24 volts, anywhere from say 24 to 29 and a half volt, with the door switch shut, that means that you do have a call for heat for that furnace. Here we have our basic sequence of operation for an 80% efficient gas furnace. So when we have a call for heat on a gas furnace, then we have our inducer motor turns on first, our pressure switch electrically closes, proving that the inducer motor is running, and then we have our hot surface igniter uh, is powered and heats up and it turns cherry red, and then we have our gas valve is powered with 24 volts, remember it's like 24 to 29 and a half volts, and then it mechanically opens, allowing gas to go through, then we have our flame proving process, which is our control board and our flame sensor. It's really not a flame sensor, it's just a flame rod. And we are proving the flame on the ground for the furnace and there's a dedicated ground on that control board. Then we have a blower on delay, which is starting at the control board. It's like a timing mechanism, allowing the heat exchanger to heat up before turning the blower motor on, which is step seven is when our control board powers the blower motor to push the warm air through the building. Now we're gonna expand on all of these components as we move through this. This is just the general sequence of operation for a standard 80% efficient furnace. You are arriving at the site, you're listening to the customer, and you're, you're already starting to think what could be the problem as you're walking up to the gas furnace, you're gonna see the efficiency kinda as you're walking up to it. So a 60% efficient furnace that's gonna have a cold air intake, and that is a rectangle opening. And what it's doing is after you have your, your heat rising from your burner tray, which is down low in the 60 or 70% efficient furnace, it's going to rise naturally up through the heat exchanger, and then it's gonna get mixed with the cold air before going up into the exhaust to lower the stack effect. So you're lowering the speed in which the exhaust is going up through the exhaust pipe, and so basically you're trying to lengthen the time in which the exhaust is, is traveling through the heat exchanger as the air is blowing by it, which is the conditioned air in a house or in a building. Then we have our 80% efficient gas furnace and you're gonna notice louvers on it on an 80% efficient furnace. So it's not gonna have a large rectangle cold air intake, it's just gonna have louvers. And you're gonna also see a metal exhaust. So a lot of times you're gonna see a B vent exhaust, which is a double wall exhaust pipe. But the whole point is you're gonna have metal on a 60% or 70% efficient furnace. You're gonna have metal exhaust on an 80% efficient furnace. And then when you get over to a 90% efficient furnace, you're gonna have PVC exhaust. And you may have a second pipe and that's for the combustion air. 90% efficient gas furnace is able to draw so much heat out of the exhaust that the temperature of the exhaust is almost basically the temperature of your skin. 
And so it can travel from the furnace to the exterior of the building through just PVC instead of metal exhaust pipe because the temperature of the exhaust is low. The other thing is it's PVC because you're going to have water condensing and water is created during the flame process on a 90% efficient gas furnace. And so any, uh, basically any uh, humidity that's going to condense in the exhaust pipes, you want it trickling back into the furnace and then it's going to drain out the drain on the furnace. And so you're going to also see a PVC drain as well. So that's several indicators for you to know it's a 90% efficient furnace. There is no louvers on it usually. So you're going to have either one or two PVC uh, pipes right here. One's going to be the exhaust, one's going to be the intake. On an 80% efficient furnace, you have to think, hey, how high of an efficiency can a gas furnace that's outside be? If you're going to condense some of the water created during the flame process due to that chemical reaction, and you're trying to basically just vent that out of a out of a trap, what's going to happen is outside it's going to freeze. A standard package unit is only going to be, say, 80 or 83 percent efficient, changing the gas into heat energy. And then the rest of the heat is going to have to go outside, right out of the exhaust pipe, along with that humidity. Now we're going to get into some of the history of the gas furnaces and some of the components inside. And so you just want to be aware of all this stuff so when you're walking up to a service call, you know what you're looking at. You have back, back when, and we have some of these still installed in some of the vacation homes down, uh, down by the bay where, where I live at. So we have our ocean on one side, bay on the other side. So it was a resort town. They just stuck these gas furnaces right into the floor. And this is just a natural, natural draft convection uh, floor furnace. And so you'll have this in the hallway uh, in some of these homes. And so the heater is just hanging in the crawl space. Inside of this, you don't have, uh, you don't have a 120 volt power supply powering this furnace. You just have a 750 millivolt gas valve. And so you have a 750 millivolt thermopile. And then you have a thermostat that is low electrical resistance when it's making the contacts. And so the whole point is that it's not going to lower the low voltage across the contact uh, in order to turn the, turn the heat on and power the gas valve. It's very important that you get a thermostat that's made for a 750 millivolt system. Right here you can see, here's a close-up image and you have the wiring right there on the THTP, that's kind of the common for that gas valve, and then TP, so TP is for the, the thermopile uh, for it to basically open up the, the solenoid or hold it open. And then you have your TH to THTP. That is uh, basically what's getting broken by your thermostat. And on a call for heat, you're connecting the circuit and allowing power to that stage inside of the, inside of the gas valve. And so you're allowing the, the gas flow to come out when you are powering it with your 750 millivolt gas valve. So you just got to remember one is to hold the, the pilot open, and then the second is to open the main gas. And so what you need to think about with some of these are that when you have a load on the main gas, uh, you should not be dropping any lower than say 190 millivolts. And if you did, uh, that would indicate maybe that you don't have a flame kind of enveloping the thermopile, or maybe it's out of position, or maybe the thermopile is bad. You really wanna shoot for something closer to say 250 millivolts uh, when you are powering your main gas. Uh, so you got to have it high enough in order to electrically uh, or mechanically open that solenoid valve. Anyway, so we have 60% efficient gas furnaces. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time, but I just want to kind of give you some of the components that are in these systems because you may find some of these same components even in 80% efficient furnaces. But once again, you see a cold air intake right there in the front of this furnace. Some of the oldest furnaces do not have control boards, but they have a fan center control. So it's very important for you to know what that is. We have our general purpose relay right here and you have a transformer, and then you have your plug and wiring. You can see that right here. So fan center control is made up of a 24 volt transformer, a thermostat terminal plate, and it's not all connected. It's only the common and the hot. And then you have a plug and a general purpose relay. So we have videos on general purpose relays. We have a video on a fan center control. So if your pain point is not knowing what that is, or either one of those components, make sure that you are watching a video on that in order to determine what that is so that when you see it, you're not overwhelmed. A lot of technicians end up getting overwhelmed because there's just a big jumble of wires and several components that they're not aware of or they're not confident in troubleshooting or don't know how they work. But if you know how each of the components work, when you open up the furnace, you're, it's gonna be very 
uh, much easier in order for you to diagnose what the problem is once you have confidence and you understand each of the components. Fan limit switches. Uh, so this is not only a limit in order to stop the furnace from overfiring or um, say overheating, but it's also a mechanism to turn the blower motor on and off during heating mode. Right here on the dial, you're gonna see three little uh, pieces right here. This, this top piece right here, you see it's set at about 165 or so. That is the limit, okay? So that is going to shut off the, the power to the gas valve. We have right here, the second one, the one in the middle is at about 125 or so, 120. That, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, by the way, that is when the furnace blower motor is gonna turn on. And then we have our last uh, piece right here on the dial, and that is set at about 90 degrees. And so you wanna think about uh, this dial being set at the proper, um, proper amount because this is when the blower motor turns off. If you set this down at say 70 degrees and it's 74 in the building, it's never going to turn off. It's never going to turn the blower motor off. And so you want to know uh, that it's going to shut off properly. As well, this, this uh, bimetal right here tends to get out of parameters due to contraction and expansion over its lifetime. And so if you have it set down too low, say you're trying to eke out that last amount of efficiency out of a warm heat exchanger and you set it down to 80, 80 degrees, once it gets out of parameter, it may be 72 degrees and it's still not turning the blower motor off. You wanna think about that as a service tech as well. If you just push this up a little bit, you're probably gonna notice that the blower motor is gonna shut off. It's also important for you to know what temperature it is in the heat exchanger while you're setting this stuff. Like if you're troubleshooting and you think it's overheating or something like that, you want a good temperature meter uh, in order to take your measurements. So I just want you to know how this, how this works. We have a, another a video on the fan limit switches. They also have a button in order to bypass. So you could uh, push that in or pull it out. So pulling it out, it leaves it on auto. Pushing it in is going to turn the blower motor and keep it on all the time. So we have furnaces that use a shaded pole blower motor or we, use, we have ones that use a capacitor. The ones that don't have a capacitor on the outside and it does have holes in the frame and it's on an older furnace, those are shaded pole blower motors. There is no capacitor. They're less electrically efficient than a permanent split capacitor blower motor, one that needs a capacitor to start and to run. On some of the older gas furnaces, you're gonna see a burner tray, just like say on a cast iron boiler, you'll see a burner tray instead of burner tubes. And so you just have this entire tray uh, with your flame, and then you just have your exhaust rising naturally. You have a manually lit system. So this is a combination gas valve, but uh, you have a 30 millivolt thermocouple, and that's attached to a solenoid. And that solenoid may need about say 13 millivolts in order to hold the solenoid in place. So just because you have power at the the thermocouple does not mean that the solenoid is going to suck in. On these combination gas valves and also on the 750 millivolt gas valves, you have to first do the work of pushing the solenoid in by pressing in on the button. And then the, the thermocouple has to heat up. Same thing with the thermal pile. It has to heat up in order to create the millivolts, the power in order to hold the solenoid in place. So every solenoid is different, but I would say the minimum that you're going you're gonna to want to measure with a load would be 13 millivolts, uh, but of course you would like to have higher, maybe 20, 25, or close to 30, that would be great. And then you can just power this with 24 volts for the main uh, gas flow to come through. But once again, your, your thermocouple is the flame proving process and it's holding uh, that first valve area open in order for you to, when you power it with 24 volts, it'll allow the, the gas flow to go, to go through. So once again, that's a combination uh, gas valve. So the next step in the kind of the evolution of gas furnaces, and when I say evolution, I don't mean Carrier Bryant, I just mean things have changed over a long period of time, is the intermittent pilot gas valve. So with this type of a gas valve, you don't have any thermocouple, you don't have a thermopile or anything like that. And so what you have is you have your, your powering your pilot valve, and that's going to allow gas to come through your pilot over to the pilot head. And then when you power your main gas valve, it's gonna allow the full gas through. When I say full gas through, what I really mean is say natural gas runs at say five to eight inch water column. It's actually gonna allow say around 3.5 inch water column going through. 
but we'll get to that in a little bit. Along with these intermittent pilot gas valves, we also have our intermittent pilot ignition modules. These were the first control boards kind of in gas furnaces. And so you're still gonna see these in 90% efficient gas furnaces. You're gonna see them in boilers and pool heaters and all kinds, of, all kinds of stuff. These were typically spark ignition, at least the first ones were. We have the intermittent pilot control modules matched with the intermittent pilot gas valve. And so these modules use flame rectification in order to prove the flame. Here you see that we have our two rod set up. So one rod is the flame sensor and the rod that you see is very close to the termination head, which is right here. This is the termination head and here is the, the spark rod. It's about one eighth of an inch right there. And that's about what's needed in order for the, say, 10,000 volts. So anywhere from, say, 6,000 to 20,000 volts to jump across there. But typically, it's around 10,000 to spark. And then you have your gas coming out of the pilot head, and it's being ignited. As you can see right here, your flame rod is kind of out of the way of the flame. So this would be bad if that's spun and it was out of the way of the flame because the flame may be a little closer to the pilot head. Over on this one over here, you can see that the flame rod is closer to the pilot head. And so that rod is going to get enveloped in the flame and the flame is going to complete the electrical circuit. That's what's important to know about this is the flame right there is going to prove that the flame exists by completing the electrical circuit, it's also going to be rectifying alternating current and changing it to direct current. And that direct current is going to be seen on the ignition module over here. We're going to get into flame rectification in a bit, but the whole point of this is that on these ignition modules uh, with these, uh, the, the intermittent pilot ignition modules, you're going to check for flame rectification on the ground. It's important to check it on the ground because some of these uh, don't have a two rod setup. Some of them are a single rod setup. And what that means is that the sparker and flame rod are, are one and the same. And so it can be a little confusing. So we would just check it from the GND flame rectification with our multimeter in series between the GND and the wire that attaches to the ground frame of the gas valve. Or, you know, we can just go ahead and clip it to this uh, ground. So what's happening is on the, the pilot head, it's using the pilot tube as a ground wire going back to the gas valve. And then we have a wire going from the gas valve going over to the GND on the intermittent uh, pilot module, control module. If you were to disconnect the GND wire off of that module, the flame's going to shut off because that's how the flame rectification signal is getting back to that board. Moving on from say 60% efficient gas furnaces to 80% efficient, uh, we have louvers on the furnace right here. So you can see that you can see a metal exhaust pipe. So same right there, louvers and a metal exhaust pipe. What you have now is an inducer motor. So the inducer motor is pulling the exhaust through the longer heat exchanger and you're attaining a higher uh, efficiency in changing the gas from, well, from gas to heat energy, but you're not losing as much out of the exhaust pipe. You can also have a furnace be multi-poised because you're pulling the exhaust through it. It's no longer has to be gravity. Now examples of 80% efficient gas furnace heat exchangers, you can see that they're very long, so they can be made several different ways. And then you have the gas furnaces uh, are using on these 80% efficient furnaces, they're using burner tubes instead of burner trays. So the whole point is that it's mixing the, the, the gas in the air right here, just like on the burner tray. But then what's happening is you have the flame sitting on the front of the burner retention head over here. Then the exhaust enters into the heat exchanger. Once it enters into the heat exchanger, it gets pulled through that whole thing and then pulled through the inducer motor and then pushed out through the exhaust pipe. So 80% efficient furnaces have an inducer motor that's either a shaded pole inducer motor or it's a PSE inducer motor. So shaded pole means there is no capacitor on the side of that inducer motor, so you won't see that. And it'll look just like a, uh, say a, a fan motor or say on a microwave or maybe a walk-in box or something like that. There is no capacitor. Now, sometimes you have to be careful because there's a little box on the side of the inducer motor that may house a square type of capacitor instead of a metal larger type capacitor. The whole point is that when that capacitor fails, you want to, or even before that, obviously, you want to go ahead and replace that with the same MFD 
rating, so the microfarad rating, but the same or higher voltage rating. That means that if you don't have one of these little black ones, you can replace a small black capacitor with a larger one as long as it's the same microfarad reading, uh, but the same or higher voltage rating. Now, older inducer motors may have oil ports, and so you'll see maybe one here and then one up towards the front, and you wanna make sure to oil that, say, uh, two times a season, uh, one at the beginning of heating season, and one towards the middle or end, and the whole point is that you wanna fill up that, that felt pad so it holds all the oil, and then it gets drawn into the oil bearing, and the oil bearing is nothing more than one uh, piece of of metal that's in a fixed position and another one that's rotating on the inside of it and you have a film of oil in between the two. If that dries out, the metal is gonna rub on the other piece of metal, it's gonna cause friction. It could even potentially cause a fire on that inducer motor, but a lot of times what we see as technicians in the field is that that inducer motor is seized up. So if you go and oil it after it's seized up, it's almost a, almost a guarantee that it's going to be seizing up again and so you gotta think you're gonna be replacing that inducer motor. You don't wanna just oil it and say, hey, I fixed it, and that's it. You're gonna wanna replace that inducer motor with a, a oil, like a uh, oil sealed bearing uh, inducer motor, so one that does not have oil ports on it. All 80% efficient furnaces have an inducer motor with a metal shroud around it, so it's not plastic on an 80% efficient furnace because the exhaust temperature is still high. Well, the problem with this whole thing is that the inducer motor wheel a lot of times is going to rot due to the water vapor uh, in the exhaust. It's just going to <laughs> rot and you might lose blades, you might lose the entire uh, fan blade assembly. Well, these tend to fail faster or sooner than a 90% efficient uh, furnace would that in a 90% efficient furnace inducer motor would be plastic. So next we have our pressure switch, and the pressure switch is one of the most maybe misunderstood items in a gas furnace. And a lot of times there's tubes going all over the place. You may have one pressure switch, you may have three or even four pressure switches inside of a gas furnace, and you need to know what's going on. First of all, you need to know how that pressure switch works. And so we have a video on, on how pressure switches work, and so make sure to check that out. The pressure switch proves that the inducer motor is functioning, the exhaust is not clogged, and it has multiple other functions uh, depending on where the pressure switch is mounted as far as the condensate drain and things like that, condensate trap. On a, a pressure switch, you're gonna have a tag. In this case, it says 0.8 inch water column. So what you need to really think about is one PSI equals 27.6 inches of water column. And so what we're really talking about is a very, very small change from atmospheric pressure. You're looking for a pressure differential needed in order to close the electrical switch of a pressure switch. Right here you see there's an air chamber, a spring, a diaphragm, and then you have your switching mechanism, and then you have your other side, your other air chamber. Pressure switches may or may not have the water column rating on the tag. You may have to look up the model number in Google uh, or in in a, in a trade part uh, program in order to determine, you know, what the rating actually is for that pressure switch in order to test it. Here we have the inside of a pressure switch. You can see it's closing. So normally it's gonna be like this. It's gonna be uh, electrically open if there is two tabs, one here and one here, but some have three. That means that one switch is normally closed and one is normally open. And when the pressure uh, lowers on the spring side, so it's the, you have two air chambers, and so when the pressure lowers on the, on the spring side, and this pressure is not necessarily increased, it's just you have a, a differential of pressure, it's gonna overcome the spring pressure, it's going to close the normally open set of contacts, and it's going to open up the normally closed set of contacts. Here we're just gonna take a look at our two air chambers. Each chamber has a hole in it, and so that's very important to know. So even if you don't have a port like that, you can see that you're gonna connect a, a hose to on the one side, there is still a tiny little hole there. And then you have where you're gonna connect your hose to on the other side, and that's always on the, the side that has the spring. And remember that the spring is adjustable. And so you, if you were to look on the back of a pressure switch, you're gonna see like some glue there. And so if you were to take that glue off, you could actually adjust that. But you don't wanna adjust a, like a, a pressure switch that's been specced for that particular furnace but you can install your adjustable pressure switch and set it to the proper inches of water column measurement that the furnace is looking for for that inducer motor and, uh, and condensate trap. Testing the pressure switch while it's connected to the system, you can disconnect the two wires uh, that are going to the pressure switch. 
So one should be 24 volt hot and the other one will, will just not have any power on it. It's basically, once those two are connected, it's proving that the inducer motor is running. So if you were to disconnect those and just put them somewhere where they're not going to um, arc against the, the, the ground frame, uh, and then what you're gonna do is turn the heat on and you're going to T in between the pressure switch and the inducer motor if, if you're talking about a single port pressure switch. It's also important to note that that pressure switch has to be vertical. It still has to be like, like this right here. It cannot be flat like that because then you're adding more pressure down onto that spring. You're adding the entire diaphragm weight down onto that spring. So it has to be like this. And then you can go ahead and check your water column measurement. This particular tool right here, this is the uh, Fieldpiece SDMN6. That one right there comes with some uh, wires and an indicator light telling you if the switch is closed or open. I don't like to do that. I like to have a multimeter connected onto that pressure switch uh, so that I can read the electrical resistance. When it is open, the switch is open, I should be reading OL on my multimeter when I'm reading electrical resistance. When it's closed, I should be reading 0.0, .0 ohms of electrical resistance, meaning there's no electrical resistance uh, stopping electrical flow once I add power to one of those terminals in order for it to come across or come, come, come across the switch. If that pressure switch was measuring say one or two ohms or three ohms of electrical resistance, that means that the contacts are pitted and bad. And that could be the problem. I wanna see that. I wanna see that with my multimeter so I use both tools when I'm testing a pressure switch. You can also just turn the power off to the gas furnace and you could disconnect the wires from the pressure switch and you could use this particular tool because it has an internal pump. And you can use that internal pump in order to determine what inches of water column measurement is needed in order to close the normally open sets of contacts right here. You could use this tool uh, basically in order to isolate the pressure switch. So if you're confused, there's too many hoses going everywhere for that pressure switch and you, you think that that pressure switch is the problem, you could eliminate the entire gas furnace just for a sec. And, and just test it individually by itself as a single component with that particular tool right there. Once again, I always connect my multimeter onto this as well. Going on to the next thing here, and we're gonna get into some more with the pressure switches and hoses and stuff like that, but I just wanna kinda keep going. Another thing that's kind of happened in the innovations of gas furnaces, you gotta remember that the manufacturers that were designing these furnaces uh, were designing them so that they are safe, electrically efficient, the, that maybe the manufacturer could have less components in there or have it be maybe less expensive or whatever that may be. And so in this case, what this particular manufacturer did is they combined the gas valve and the ignition module into one thing. And so this is the smart valve. We have four wires here and three wires right here. We have a, a little wiring diagram right here so that you can kind of see you have your 24 volt hot and your common. Your EFT is your electric fan timer output. In order to have uh, power going to the hot surface igniter and then for this uh, gas valve to allow pilot gas to be ignited by the hot surface igniter, like before any of that's happening, you have to have 24 volts on this one tap right here on the smart valve. And so you're also gonna be going through the pressure switch. I just want you to know what this is. I've got uh, several, I think I've got two videos on the smart valve right there. So make sure to check those out, like the entire function and how it works and everything. I want you to be aware of that. We have a lot of these smart valves in 90% efficient furnaces around here. After you have your, your pilot is lit and you're proving that the flame is present at this flame rod and, and it's, it's basically traveling your flame rectification signal is traveling back through the pilot tube back to the ground of the gas valve. And then there's a, a wire picking it up from the ground of the gas valve into this control board that's underneath of this cover right here in order to determine that you do have a flame present. It's using flame rectification in order to determine that. And you have your flame is connecting the electrical circuit and rectifying alternating current to direct current. Basically, you might have anywhere from say 80 volts to 180 volts getting sent to this flame rod right here. This flame rod does not touch this other piece of metal here. That is just the, that's just the ground right there. Uh, but what's happening is you have that alternating current is getting rectified and over at this gas valve, it may, be, it may have two uh, microamps for your DC electrical current that is reading for the flame rectification process in order to determine 
that the flame is present. So we have videos on that, so you can check that out. Another version of the smart valve is powered with 120 volts, and it has an error code status light. And so you can see that there's a little uh, light indicator right there. And so it uses the same uh, HSI, the hot surface igniter, and flame rod as the other one. Here we have our intermittent pilot ignition system. And so I just want you to see what you would not normally see. This is inside of the furnace. So you'd see the back of this. So you, you wouldn't be seeing the front. You'd be seeing back, back here and, and not up front. But the whole point of this is it is a little dangerous, right? In order to only be proven the flame at one location right here. And if you see in this photo, it's actually not really mounted properly and it's dropped down below the burner tube. So that, that's a safety concern right there, right? On our direct ignition systems, it's safer because it's proving the flame uh, across from one point over to the other. Now on these, um, on these intermittent pilot uh, gas valve assemblies, which can be found on 90% efficient furnace, uh, we have our flame rollout switches. So you have one here on one side and one on the other side of the combustion chamber assembly. Now, some manufacturers may only have one, and that's, in my opinion, it's not as safe uh, as you having one on each side of the combustion box. In fact, if I ever have a problem with a gas furnace, sometimes I install a secondary one just to, just to make sure it's safe. For the direct ignition control modules, some use spark and some used hot surface ignition. And so we're talking about 120 volt hot surface igniter. Right here, let's just look, this will be the front. You wouldn't see this because this will be closer to the uh, heat exchanger area in a gas furnace. I just pulled this assembly out so that you could see the, the front of it. But here you have two rods and you have an eighth of an inch between the two and that's where your spark is occurring at. You're basically igniting the, the gas over here and the gas has to travel across the burner faces all, all the way over to the other side. And then you have alternating current being sent through that flame rod into the flame and over to the burner retention head. When the current is traveling through the flame, it's rectified and then you just have a smaller uh, microamp signal for direct current on that burner retention head. And then you use the ground frame in order to get it back to the wire uh, that if you notice, there's a little spade connector right here going back to the ignition module. So that's completing your circuit for your flame identification. So here's your uh, direct hot surface ignition. And so you have a hot surface igniter on the one side. What you want to think about how this is different uh, then a pilot uh, gas valve is that a pilot gas valve allows a gas to the, only the pilot and then you have some type of a flame proving process that's usually outside of that gas valve unless you're talking about a smart valve. Then you have the main gas valve opens to allow the full gas flow over to the burner tubes. In this case, there is no pilot tube. You are just allowing your gas right through. It's called direct ignition because you're directly allowing your full gas flow through to the burner tubes in order to light the gas. Now, you typically are only going to have maybe say two or three seconds in order to prove that there's a flame before that gas valve is going to get shut off because that's a lot of gas that's going into the system. So you have your hot surface igniter turns cherry red, then your gas valve opens and it allows the full gas flow to all four of these burner tubes at the same time. This gets ignited first, it travels across, right across through this little channel over here, and then this is where you're proving the flame with this flame rod and connected to the control board, and you're completing the circuit via the flame through the ground wire going back to the control board. You have to have gas uh, ignited from here all the way over to here in order for the flame to be proven over on this side. As you can see, we've had a little issue here and here on this uh, furnace. I don't know where this was pulled out of, but as you can see, you had a little bit too much heat on both of these sides right here. This is very important. I want you to know that the, that the flame rod, it's not an actual sensor, even though it's called a flame sensor. You shouldn't be going around changing these out. There really is no reason to change out a normal large flame rod or flame sensor. In fact, I would encourage you to just call it a flame rod. All it is is a stainless steel rod that has ceramic around the base and then it has a little mounting clip right here and then a spade connector welded to that, that rod. So the whole point of this is that what you're doing is you're connecting a wire from the control board to send alternating current via this rod into the flame. That is it. And so then you have this ceramic piece isolating the ground from that alternating current. On direct ignition systems, a lot of times you're gonna see 
or you're going to measure a voltage between this spade connector and the ground, you can measure with your multimeter maybe 85 to 120 volts for your alternating current that's getting sent into this. Now, if you put your multimeter in series, that's how you can check for your flame notification, uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit. We have our direct ignition gas valve. You see there's an on-off button right here, and you just have your, your, your gas in and your gas out. And then you have right here is a vent, and then right here is where you can adjust the gas pressure. There's a little spring in there. Measuring the inlet and the outlet of the gas valve. Uh, so this is a direct ignition gas valve. You wanna know what input gas there is going into that, going into that furnace. You wanna know that the gas line is sized properly because if the gas line that's supplying the, the furnace is undersized, and when that furnace turns on, the, the actual pressure and volume in the pipe lowers, or you turn on, say, a, uh, a water heater or a dryer or whatever else in the building, and all of a sudden the pressure lowers at the, at the furnace, that can cause issues. So you need to be aware of that, especially if it's like an intermittent problem. Right here, you can see our natural gas input is normally anywhere is right around five inch water column to eight inch water column. So what's that? About a quarter of a PSI? It's really not that much pressure. Natural gas outlet uh, pressure is usually between three and 3.8 inch water column. And so you're gonna set that with your, along with your combustion analyzer in order to try to get your, your most efficient burn. It's maybe 3.3, it may be 3.5 inch water column, or maybe, you know, whatever in there. You can use a standard ratcheting service wrench, the same one that you would use at the uh, service valves on an air conditioning system in order to take out the little Allen screw. So you wanna first turn off the gas add a gas furnace first, turn off the valve, and then be able to take those taps out in order to measure your pressure. You could also measure your inlet gas pressure over at the, the cap at the outside of the unit, like on the drip leg, if you have an adapter uh, for that. You wanna measure what your outlet gas pressure is uh, and be able to adjust that uh, for efficiency. And to know, is the gas valve sputtering? Like, do you have a troubleshooting problem and the gas valve uh, is not acting the way it should? You know, and you can see maybe a sputtering of the flame. That could be an air problem. That could be uh, a gas valve problem. Uh, it could be several things. Now, LP inlet is normally about 11 to 13 inches of water column, and that's about a half of a PSI. LP gas outlet may be anywhere from, say, like 9.5 to 10.5 inch water column, and that's for a single stage gas valve, a uh, single stage direct ignition gas valve. You don't want to just set it at 10 for, for no reason. You want to set it at whatever the manufacturer is specifying for that particular unit. That's just normally what it's at. So don't go by this as far as setting your gas pressure. Make sure you're following the, the uh, rating plate of the gas furnace. It's usually on the cover of the furnace as far as your, your pressure, uh, what to set the pressures at. For gas furnaces, they normally are coming as natural gas and then you can convert them to LP by changing the orifice out, you can change the spring out in the gas valve, you may have to change your combustion air, and you're gonna have to set the gas pressure uh, while that system is running. You wanna put a sticker on it, let everybody know, hey, this has been changed to LP. You're gonna do your combustion analysis to, uh, to verify that you got a clean burn. Uh, so you're gonna to wanna to do those things anytime that you're converting from natural gas to LP. Silicon carbide hot surface igniters. So some people are asking why why do they look like this? So the whole point is that the gas, the fuel gas, is traveling kind of through this and around it. You're increasing the surface area on that hot surface igniter uh, to help with ignition. You don't want a late ignition, you want an immediate ignition. And the silicon carbide, though they don't last as long as the silicon nitride, sometimes because of the way uh, gas furnace is designed, the combustion chamber and stuff like that, you may just want to replace it with another silicon carbide because of the surface area. Uh, because of how it's able to kind of get over the whole area where the gas is flowing over. You can uh, replace that with a silicon nitride. You just got to be aware of the positioning of that silicon nitride hot surface igniter. But we'll get into that in a bit. You do not want to visually inspect a hot surface igniter to see if it's cracked. You want to test it with your multimeter while it's still in place. One of my first service calls I got sent to and I, I was visually checking a hot surface igniter. I mean, obviously this is when I just had started out. Nobody had told me what to do. Unfortunately, I wish I, wish I did know a little bit more at that time and I didn't. I, I pulled that hot surface igniter out, I cracked it, no good. And I had to install a brand new hot surface igniter in there and that wasn't even the problem. Like I'm saying, just disconnect the plug. So there's a plug for the hot surface igniter 
and what you want to do is you can just turn the power off to the furnace and you can check the electrical resistance of the hot surface igniter. So it may be anywhere from say 40 to 65 ohms of electrical resistance and that means that that hot surface igniter is still good. And that's for say a 120 volt hot surface igniter. The 24 volt hot surface igniters are going to be a, a different ohm range, uh, resistance range. If you ever measure OL when you're checking your electrical resistance on the two wires that lead to the hot surface igniter, that indicates that that hot surface igniter is bad. It's cracked and when you do finally pull it out, then you can actually see where it's usually white at or maybe broken. Uh, so that's what happens when they fail. They end up breaking and stopping the electrical uh, circuit right there. Testing a silicon nitride hot surface igniter. Here you see we're reading 48 ohms and just so you know, if it's still hot, the electrical resistance is gonna be higher. Uh, but in this case, since we're not reading OL, we know that the hot surface igniter is still good. Anytime that you have this, you wanna have that flat blade uh, facing the, the burner tube because you want more surface, more surface area, not less surface area uh, in front of the gas in order to ignite it. Here we have a 80% efficient uh, package unit. And so when you're looking at these, these take a lot of abuse. And the whole point is that they're outside all the time. And so a lot of components rust. You'll get spider webs down here and insect problems and just they're just rotting. We have a lot of issues. The metal uh, inducer motor, the capacitor, the, the combustion chamber, the whole thing. Rusting at the burner retention heads. This right here is very rusted. And so you end up having to replace multiple things when you're rebuilding uh, a package unit. It may not benefit you to just do one thing at a time. It may benefit you to just kind of go through and clean, clean it up. Most of these package units you're gonna see, they're gonna have a spark ignition. It's gonna be a direct spark ignition usually that you're gonna find in these 80% efficient package units outside. On our blower motors, you're gonna typically see a permanent split capacitor blower motor on the any of the 80% efficient furnaces, the older ones, and older 90% or 92% efficient gas furnaces. But then we kind of moved on to other blower motors as well, but these were very prevalent in the 80% time period. Some 80% efficient furnaces will still have a fan limit switch, so you need to be aware of that. Some units uh, used a sequencer in order to control when the blower motor turned on. So it's waiting for the heat exchanger to warm up before the blower motor turned on. And some units, especially if they're very compact units, have used a sequencer in order to accomplish that task. So make sure you know how the sequencer works. And I have a video on that as well. So you can just look up, say on YouTube, AC Service Tech Sequencer and you'll find the video for that. So here is a control board. Uh, so during the whole evolution of these gas furnaces, even on 90% efficient furnaces, uh, you're gonna start to see the furnace control boards being integrated, but here we have a fan timing furnace control board. And so the whole point of this is that it does control the inducer motor, the power to the inducer motor, but it does not control the ignition. You need to know what you're looking at. So if you have a problem with ignition and you go and replace this board, it's not gonna do you any good at all. So you gotta know what it is. So right here we have our integrated furnace control board. This is basically taking our fan timer board and our ignition module and making them one, one thing. That's why it says integrated for the furnace control board. So it's an IFC. And these have LED status code lights. And of course, some of the ignition control modules had uh, LED status code lights. You can see our flame rod right here is just sitting there next to our uh, IFC and both of these IFC you see these large blocks so the black blocks it may be gray blocks white blocks those are relays they're direct current relays on the control board and anytime you have those are typically for uh, a furnace that has PSC or shaded pole inducer motors. It's usually PSC. So you're just switching power on and off to the blower motor or on and off to the inducer motor. Here you have the, uh, the limit switches right here. And so the IFC constantly monitors to see is one of these uh, electrically open. They should be electrically closed all the time. And over here you have your flame rollout switch. So you, can, you know a flame rollout switch is only manually reset by a button, but our regular thermal limit switches right here, they will automatically reset and they use a little bimetal disc in order to uh, pop the electrical switch up uh, and open it, or it's gonna naturally sit in the closed position. Uh, this one right here reaches further into the plenum part of the gas furnace next to the heat exchanger in order to determine, you know, is this furnace overheating? And that's the whole point. This one right here is actually on an older 60% efficient furnace. Uh, that's an older style. 
but these are fairly common. Any one of these three right here are fairly common. This one, uh, somewhat common. And then you always have your different versions of your flame rollout switch. Measuring uh, safety switches. So we have a video, three ways to measure a switch, you know, when you're working on the HVAC system. So make sure you check that out. Here we have two, two ways. You could uh, turn the power off to the furnace. You could disconnect the electrical wires and then just take a resistance reading across the switch. If you read 0, 0.0 ohms of electrical resistance, then your switch is good and it is closed presently. And if you are reading a well, then that means it's open. However, you gotta make sure, hey, is that, is that switch still warm? You know, is the bimetal disc still warm? You have to wait for it to cool down before checking it that way. Yeah, if you had your power wire still connected to uh, the switch over here on this right hand panel right here, if you were to, to do that, and just, you know, you have to imagine if you did have your two wires still on there. If you measured across a switch zero volts, but you do know that you have 24 volts supplying it, then that means there is no difference in the voltage across the switch. Meaning that if this switch was open and you measured voltage from one side to the other side, you would read 24 volts if it was electrically open. In this case, it's not, it's reading 0.0, .0 volts. So that means that that switch is electrically closed if you did have the wires attached and you did have power to it. I prefer jumping around in the furnace by putting uh, my multimeter on voltage and taking one of my probes and putting it on the ground or the common on the on the furnace control board. Make sure that the door switch is closed and then you can take your other probe and just kind of put it on each of the switches on both sides. You're kind of playing hopscotch a little bit. You're just one, okay, I, I read 24 volts. I read 24 volts there. Next switch, I read 24 volts. And then on the other side of the switch, oh, all of a sudden I don't read it anymore. That means that that switch is the one that's the problem. Because you got to remember you have like you may have like four or even five of these switches inside of a gas furnace. So you may have temperature limit switches uh, going to the control board, and then you may have your flame rollout switches. Sometimes they're all together in series. And so you wanna check each one individually. And so you can do that real quickly. So make sure to check that video out where you're just putting one probe on the common or the ground, because remember on a gas furnace, on say 80, any 80% 80 or 90% efficient furnace or higher, your common for your transformer is connected to the ground frame. So you could just connect it at a good ground on the furnace anywheres and then take your other probe and try to measure for your 24 volt power. Remember your 24 volt power is anywhere between 24 and 29 and a half volts. The IFC sends alternating current to the flame rod and measures direct current. So DC microamps on a dedicated ground from the combustion box. We have our little animated picture over here and so hopefully that is a good indication where the flame uh, or a good picture of how the flame is completing the circuit. What we would do is we turn the power off to the furnace, put our multimeter in series between the flame rod and the wire going to the flame rod. And we're gonna be measuring direct current microamps, okay? Even though we are supplying alternating current to the flame. If you remember when I was talking about the uh, ignition control modules, we usually check that on the ground of the, of the furnace. And we're checking it between the ignition control module and the ground wire. On direct ignition systems, you're checking it on say the supply side. You're checking it on the wire before it gets to uh, the rod. Once again, just put your multimeter in series. I have a couple videos on flame rectification so you're aware of how to do that and how to measure for that. In this case, in this image right here, we're measuring 2.4 microamps. You, you wanna have somewhere between say two microamps and say 10 microamps. You may measure 12, you may measure four. I mean, really it'd be better if you had higher than three, but some furnaces may have a little bit lower than, than three, maybe 2.5, 2.6, 2.3. So really you wanna make sure that it's up above two. If you have an intermittent problem, uh, with your gas furnace and you have an LED status code light that's indicating, hey, you have a flame rectification problem, you know, you're gonna be measuring that, you know, and you're gonna notice, hey, maybe my signal is, is low. And so you wanna see, is that flame in, engulfing that flame rod? You know, what you're gonna wanna do is clean the flame rod with unsoaped or non-soaped steel wool. You wanna clean it and make sure it's clean with the power off to the furnace because that rod is gonna have power on it all the time. Any uh, residue, any carbon buildup on that rod or any rust on the burner retention head is gonna act like electrical resistance in this flame rectification circuit. So you wanna clean those things. You know, you may have a problem just right here at the face of the burner retention head where the flame sits at and that may be the problem. There's two ways that you can test uh, the ground circuit. So one 
is electrical resistance. So with the power off to the gas furnace, what you can do is you can clip one alligator clamp on your multimeter over at the, the back of the uh, burner, uh, burner tube right here. So you can clip right here or clip it on the actual ground area where, say, the wire attaches to. And so the other probe is going to go to where you find the green yellow wire going to the control board. That is where the control board is attaching to the ground frame. Some uh, control boards have one of the screws that goes from the control board to the frame and that's the ground wire. Uh, but more often than not, you have a dedicated ground wire that goes to a plug and you just got to follow it, trace it back. And you're also going to notice that that attaches to the electrical gas valve as well. That's actually the common. And so that's why we're not checking it on the ground side. We're not checking the flame rectification signal on the ground side because you can mess up basically the power going to the gas valve by trying to put your multimeter in series on that side. And that's only for direct ignition systems. So what you could do is you can check for electrical resistance between the, the burner tube all the way back to where the control board is trying to, to measure the microamps at. If you have any electrical resistance between those two points, that's going to lower the signal down to a lower level. It's going to act as uh, electrical resistance to the flow of electrons, and so it's going to mess the signal up. So if you read an ohm of electrical resistance, you have a problem. You need to check your, your ground wire, your, your make sure that there's no paint or anything like that. Uh, make sure that you have a clean surface. Uh, make sure you kind of sand that down where the dedicated ground wire is attaching to the combustion chamber at. You know, there's a problem somewhere then. But you want to read 0, 0.0 ohms of electrical resistance. You might have 0.1 ohms. You don't want 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 ohms of electrical resistance. And guess what? It's not going to matter a hill of beans for you to go testing all this stuff if you cannot take your two probes of your multimeter, connect them together, and read zero ohms of electrical resistance. Sometimes your probe wires uh, on your multimeter are bad. You always want to go ahead and test your multimeter first before, before using it. So if you are connecting them like this and you're measuring electrical resistance right now, and we measured five uh, or 0.5 ohms or even 0.3 ohms, we have a problem. We should be replacing our, our probe wires uh, for new ones. You know, it could be a problem with our multimeter, but very likely it's these, these wires right here, especially if we have alligator jumpers on here. So I just want you to be aware of that. The other test that you could do is a voltage drop. And so what this is doing is with the power onto your gas furnace, uh, after you've already clipped onto your ground wire here and your common wire right here, it's going to complete the circuit all the way back at the breaker box. And so if you uh, were to disconnect the common for this furnace with like, say you're turning to turn the power off to the furnace and you disconnect the common somehow going to the, the breaker box or your power supply, you're not going to read anything right here. But if on a 120 volt furnace, if you measure between L2, your common wire and your ground, it's going to complete the circuit all the way back where it's connected inside the, the building's electrical breaker box and come all the way back and you should have very close to 0.0, .0 ohms of electrical resistance. If you have OL, then that means likely that your ground wire is disconnected somewhere, and that could be a big problem. If you had like one, two, three ohms, once again, that's a, that's a big problem, and that can affect your, your microamp signal going back onto the ground of this gas furnace, and you're going to have an intermittent problem a lot of times, and so you need to make sure that you are supplying your gas furnace with good power with a good ground going all the way back to the breaker box. The integrated furnace control board has LED status code lights, so when you're walking up to a gas furnace when you're going to service it, you want to pay special attention uh, to the little peephole on the furnace and read the status code light. However, uh, it may be uh, reading a lockout error code, and so you're still going to have to take the panels of the furnace off and then you're going to have to recall the prior error codes. And each furnace may be a little bit different in order to recall those error codes, but you want to go ahead and do that because that's going to tell you where to start your troubleshooting at. It's going to tell you, say, if it has, like, say, a pressure switch problem. It's either a pressure switch related problem. It doesn't mean that the pressure switch is bad. It could be water in the exhaust pipe, a clogged condensate drain. It could be a clogged port for the pressure switch, but it could also be a a uh, bad inducer motor or a bad wheel or the wheel is missing some of the fins. It could be multiple different things. So remember that whatever error code it's flashing, it's either that step in the sequence of operation or the earlier step. So you always want to think about that when you're troubleshooting. On the gas furnace, it'll tell you 
uh, it'll tell you the possibilities of what could be wrong right here. But you, you want to know that yourself. You don't want to be dependent on this stuff. You want to kind of be thinking about that already. 90% efficient gas furnaces. So we talked about it uh, a lot already, but the PVC exhaust, the condensate line coming off of them, there's no louvers. It could have one or two PVC exhaust pipes. And by the way, if you're installing 90% or higher efficiency gas furnaces, you want to use two pipes. You don't want to be drawing the building into a vacuum by taking combustion air, basically stealing combustion air from within the building and putting it into the furnace and then just exhausting it. Because what's going to happen is you're going to be pulling in outside air through the cracks in the windows and doors and stuff like that back into the building. Uh, and once again, your building is going to be under a vacuum. You don't want to do that. You want to take a dedicated uh, combustion air uh, tube all the way to the outside and so you can even do that with one hole through the building using what's called a concentric kit. 90% efficient gas furnaces have a primary and secondary heat exchanger. Our secondary one is a water heat exchanger and you can kind of notice that because it's a tube and fin or most furnaces are tube and fin at least. And then your primary heat exchanger is just your, your standard one like you would notice on an 80% efficient furnace. And then you have your box right here where the two join at. So really what you want to think about is your secondary heat exchanger is the first one in the air path for your, for your conditioned air in the building. What's going to happen is this heat exchanger, your secondary one, is going to be at a lower temperature because your, your flame is basically starting over here and your exhaust gets pulled in here. It's going to be hot, 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 right? But it's going to be lowering in temperature as you're exchanging heat with the conditioned air that's blowing around the heat exchanger. It's lowering in temperature, lowering in temperature, lowering in temperature, so much so to the point where the water in the exhaust is condensing in the tubes and it's running like just along right in here in this uh, secondary heat exchanger. But it's going to be lower in temperature, lower in temperature, lower in temperature, and then it's going to be trickling out of the furnace into a condensate trap. Naturally, this heat exchanger, which is a secondary heat exchanger, is going to be the first one in the air path. So the air is going to be absorbing heat from the hot but yet lower temperature um, heat exchanger. And then it's then going past the hotter heat exchanger and it's absorbing more heat and then going into the building. And so basically, if you had 70 degree air down here, by the time it gets past the, the secondary and the primary heat exchanger, it should be maybe 50 degrees higher, maybe at 120 degrees before it enters and gets distributed through the building. So as a result of cooler exhaust temps or lower temperature, uh, things aren't cold. That's just a feeling we have, right? Uh, but as you have your lower temperature exhaust, you have higher uh, gas efficiency. Because of that, you're going to have your lower exhaust temp and plastic inducer motor housings. So as a result of your lower exhaust temps, you're going to have a higher efficiency furnace with a plastic inducer motor housing. And the whole point is that the exhaust temperature is low, so we can make the inducer motor housing and wheel out of something that can uh, withstand or uh, withstand the temperature and withstand the condensing water. And so it's not going to rust. You're always going to notice these plastic inducer motor housings on 90% efficient furnaces. You may notice some that are stainless steel, but they're primarily all plastic because it's, hey, it's the lower cost, right? 90% efficient furnaces use PVC tubing for the exhaust along with the intake. We already discussed that. 90% efficient uh, furnaces require a condensate trap. Without a condensate trap, you're going to not be allowing the water to trickle out of the furnace. The whole point is that your low, uh, low pressure area and your, say, high friction is going to stop right here at the trap. Once the water gathers in the trap, it's going to be able to just trickle out naturally out of the furnace. We had some of these larger uh, condensate traps back when. Now they're making them so that you can see into them and see all the gunk or see if they're clogged. So that's, that's kind of nice. These get clogged quite a bit. So this is a lot of times what the problem is on a 90% efficient furnace. This is part of the preventative maintenance. It's cleaning the tubes. It's, and make sure that the tubes are disconnected from the pressure switch, by the way. It's cleaning the condensate traps. It's cleaning the condensate pump. It's all of those things. And the, even the tube that is leading off of the condensate pump, if you have one, there's a little check valve there, and that needs to be cleaned. So there's, there's a lot of different things uh, when you're talking about preventative maintenance on a gas furnace. And depending on what your company uh, does and how much time they allow, you know, every company is going to be different in the amount 
of preventative maintenance that they're performing. Often there is two pressure switches in a 90% efficient furnace. One is going over to the condensate trap and the other one is going over to the inducer motor housing. You can see there's one here and there's another one right behind it. Just uh, two of these pressure switches with a single port and on this case uh, in this case the backs are not connected on these two pressure switches so this looks like a jumbled mess right so we have three furnaces right here and you have a bunch of different tube layouts that are connecting from the inducer motor the combustion box gas valve pressure switch or multiple pressure switches i just want you to be aware of what's happening right here so over on the left this furnace uh, has two pressure switches. One is connecting to the trap. One's connecting to the inducer motor. While that system's running, they should both be closed. This one right here, this one in the middle, is taking a differential. And, and remember, even though we have two pressure switches over here, it's taking a differential of pressure. We're lowering the one side uh, worth of pressure while the other one's at atmospheric, even if you have a single port pressure switch. In this case, you have a tube on the front of the pressure switch and a tube on the back of the pressure switch. The back of the pressure switch is monitoring the condensate trap, while the front is, is monitoring the combustion box. Uh, so the pressure inside the sealed combustion box. As well, it's actually teed off over to the atmospheric port of the, the gas valve so that when uh, this gas valve is allowing pressure in here, it's, it's utilizing the atmospheric, atmospheric pressure within this box in order to allow the pressure to be correct. Here you have a two port pressure switch. It's taking a differential. The back side on this uh, should be lower than the front side pressure. On this furnace right here, you have one pressure switch on the bottom with one tube connecting over to the condensate trap. And then you have another pressure switch right here. And you have a tube that is connecting over to the lower part of the inducer motor. And then it has another tube on the other side that's connecting over to the combustion box. And of course, anytime you have a sealed combustion box, you're gonna have a tube connecting over to the, the gas valve. And so it's going to always go over to that atmospheric port. If you don't have a tube there, you usually have like a set screw with a little hole in it or a plastic piece that's there that's going to be allowing atmospheric pressure at that p potential uh, uh, part of that diaphragm right there for the gas valve. This one is still taking a differential. It's just taking a differential between the atmospheric pressure at that point, at that part of the furnace, like inside, you know, the frame of this furnace, which means it's gonna be the same as the outside of the furnace, but, and then you have the other tube that's going over to the inducer motor, and that's gonna be lower in pressure. And so you gotta remember that a pressure switch is always reading a differential. Even if it only has one port on it, it's gonna have atmospheric pressure on one side, and then it's gonna have the pressure tap on the other side. The pressure tap side is gonna be the side with the spring, and when your inducer motor turns on, you're lowering the pressure in that area beyond the spring pressure, and you're allowing the switch to, uh, so to mechanically close. And then it's gonna allow your electrical current across the switch, you know, in a gas furnace. In this area right here, we have a sealed combustion box. Anytime you have that, the gas valve has to be connected with a tube going over to the atmospheric uh, port of this gas valve so that uh, it can maintain the proper pressure going in to that sealed uh, combustion box. What you're gonna have here is that on the front of this pressure switch, you're gonna be connected to the combustion box. And it's taking a differential between there and the condensate trap. The condensate trap is basically almost a direct pathway over to the inducer motor. So that's gonna be the, the, the lower pressure side. I want you to know that on a pressure switch, when you have two ports, it's reading a differential, right? And they may be marked with a negative and a positive. Right here, I just want you to know that both of these pressures are lower than atmospheric pressure. It doesn't mean a positive pressure. The negative port is lower pressure than the uh, positive port. It just means a differential, no positive pressure. A furnace with only one pressure switch and a combustion box is reading a differential and this is to test the pressure switch while connected to the system. And in order to test the pressure switch while connected to the system, we want to measure the water column reading on both sides of the pressure switch. So it's very important to know that. On a pressure switch like this, there's no point in teeing into the tube on one side of the pressure switch. You need your pressure readings on both sides. It's going to look something like this. You're going to have your little brass tees or your plastic tees. With the power off, you're going to tee in. You can either read this as a differential or you could take your, your one pressure uh, and subtract that against your other pressure in order to find your differential. But that's why it's, it's nice to kind of have a uh, dual port water calm manometer. And by the way, we can't really get by with the, with the uh, 
non-digital water columnometers anymore because we have gas furnaces that are running at such a low water column pressure that you wouldn't really be able to see it on the dial anymore. It's not very helpful when you have a, um, a, a water column manometer that's just a dial type, like a compound gauge. You really want a digital version and you want to make sure that you're zeroing it out before using it and make sure that it's calibrated and functioning properly. Uh, like I said before, if you were w confused or you wanted to confirm that a pressure switch was the actual problem, what you can do is while the pressure switch is still mounted in the, in the furnace, and it has to be mounted up like this, not like this, while it's still mounted in the furnace, you can, and the power off, disconnect the electrical wires, you're going to attach your, in this case, it's a field piece SDMN6, you're not gonna have your, your tube on this side, you're gonna have it on the pump here in the middle. It's wide together, and you're gonna connect that over to the negative port of the pressure switch. So you're not gonna be connected to the positive, you're gonna be over at the negative where the, the spring is. And then you can turn your pump on and keep turning your, your, water column, your water column pressure to a lower, lower pressure than atmosphere, uh, atmospheric until your pressure switch electrically closes and you're going to measure that with your multimeter by reading the electrical resistance across the electrical contacts and so that's how you can determine if that pressure switch is in fact the problem. So once again make sure to check out our newest video on gas furnace pressure switches. So now that we've gone over that uh, we have two stage gas furnaces so you may run into some of those. So you could have a multi-speed PSE blower motor, you could have a two-speed inducer motor, that in this case is a PSE. You're going to have an additional pressure switch, because remember your inducer motor is going to be running at, at two speeds now, not just one. And you're going to have a IFC with two heat speeds, you know, for your uh, powering your inducer motor. And you're going to have a two-stage gas valve. And so this is a direct ignition gas valve. The easiest way to determine it is just by looking at the gas valve, you see two brass screws. So you know there's a, a medium and a high, or a low and a high. And just remember that most of these two-speed uh, gas valves, you're going to have to be powering both medium and high on this to open both of those up in order to allow your direct ignition to occur on your high speed. If it's just medium, then you're typically just going to have your medium speed powered. Once again, early 90% efficient furnaces had multi-speed PSE blower motors with a capacitor, but now we have ECM uh, variable speed blower motors. So the first thing that came out was more of the variable speed and you may notice like a 16 pin uh, connector on the module. So this black spot right here, this black section of the motor, that's actually a motor module on an ECM blower motor. Up here, this blue gray part, that's the frame of the blower motor and inside you have a three phase wound uh, blower motor. Over on this one right here, instead of it being a 16 pin connector, you're gonna see just a four pin connector and a five pin right here. With these variable speed ECM blower motors, these are also known as constant airflow. If you ever hear these weird terminology, you know, kind of thrown out there, constant airflow, what they're really talking about is the variable speed blower motors. So these don't have the 24 volt signals to turn on and turn off. However, the manufacturer has uh, made these so that you could test them with a 24 volt signal. You may have a, a tester tool that you could use such as a TechMate Pro in order to check this with just a 24 volt signal. So that, that particular tool right there, it has a 16 pin connector and it also has a four pin connector and you're just powering it with 24 volts on the certain pins just to see if the inducer motor is even gonna turn on. But you may also have other problems with a variable speed blower motor such as the blower motor doesn't shut off you know, you could have it ramping up, ramping down, ramping up, ramping down. And a lot of times that's due to some uh, airflow problem, such as a clogged filter or something like that. Like a completely clogged filter has done damage to that ECM blower motor due to the high electrical current from that inducer motor module, allowing more current to the motor in order to overcome the friction. So anytime you have an ECM, electronically controlled module, you're going to have a communicating control board. And so instead of it having the large black relays on the, on the control board, on the integrated furnace control board, it's gonna just be sending signals and talking with the module. So you're gonna have the module talking back and forth with the IFC control board. Once again, in order to tell if your motor is the problem, you could just disconnect the communication wire, connect the TechMate Pro, 
and see if the inducer, uh, if the blower motor is actually going to turn on or not. If the blower motor does not turn on, then the blower motor module is the problem. A lot of times you're going to have to buy the module and the motor uh, together. And a lot of times the regular motor shell is not going to be damaged. So this part right here is usually not going to be damaged unless a capacitor blows inside. There's a, usually a couple capacitors in here. You have a, a bad electrical surge or a high or low uh, voltage at the building. You could have one of the capacitors blow and it'll squirt fluid into the, the motor. In that case, you definitely want to replace that, that motor. But you also want to think about like motor bearings and stuff like that. You might as well just go ahead and replace the whole thing, even if you only have to uh, replace the module. Okay, so here you see the modules. Uh, you can visually inspect them. So right here you have a burnt capacitor. It's actually mushroomed, just like you would see on a, a run capacitor off of a air conditioning unit or something like that. It's leaking fluid. It's obvious that it's bad. You could have right here, there's like a round pill type PTC thermistor. It's actually acting as a current limiter in this, in this instance, and that is, is burnt off and bad. It's possible to just replace that particular item if you soldered a new one in, uh, but really this module is bad in this instance. And over here, the, uh, you can see for that PTC thermistor, it's actually melted uh, the, the, the rubber right here or the silicone. You can see that this one is burnt and bad. I don't know if you can actually see it or not, but the whole point is that you can, you can visually inspect it, a module. You can smell it if it's burnt. You can test it with your TechMate Pro tester. So there's three different ways to kind of uh, determine if a module is bad. And you can just take electrical resistance readings on the rest of the motor. It's just a three-phase motor. So each pair should be equaling the other two pairs when you're checking electrical resistance with a multimeter. We have our variable speed inducer motor uh, was introduced and this contributed to increased electrical efficiency. And so you match a ECM variable speed blower motor and a variable speed inducer motor with maybe a two-speed or a three-speed uh, gas furnace. ECM multi-speed motors, you're going to hear them, uh, hear of them as either ECM multi-speed or ECM constant torque. And so really that just means the same thing. These are pretty easy to troubleshoot. Really, you're going to have your, your power in, you just make sure that you have your 120 volts or your 240 volts in, and then you just measure on, on the tap that's supposed to be being powered with 24 volts. Hey, do I have 24 volts there? If I don't have 24 volts there, then we're not really calling for that blower motor to turn on. If you do have 24 volts on one, two, three, four, or five, and it's programmed to run on all five of those speeds, then, then that blower motor is bad. But just remember that the off, even though there's five taps, there may only be two taps that are programmed. But the whole point is that the other ones should still be on default, so it should still turn on if you have 24 volts on one of them. That's the whole point. Your common for your 24 volts is going to be up here, and then you're going to have any time that you supply hot on five, four, three, two, or one taps, that blower motor should turn on. So it's very easy to determine, is that blower motor operating? the way it should, or is it not? If you're looking at like, say like a Gen Tech, it'd be like an X13, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. The broad ocean models, uh, they, have, they have ones that usually have a plug like this. The X13s usually have a plug on the side of the units. Here's another example of a broad ocean one where it just has the, the wire sticking out, and then it has the wiring diagram right here on the side. On really high efficiency gas furnaces, you may run into uh, units that are a three-stage gas valve or three stages of gas. And it's really made up of a two-stage gas valve with a third stage, and the third stage is the lowest stage. So this will be considered the low, and this is the medium, and this is the high. So you could have that. You could have a modulating gas valve. So you want to be aware of all of these different types of gas valves that you could potentially run into. You have your control board up here on the top, and this is going to be communicating with your IFC your integrated furnace control board. Now here's just a rundown of a bunch of different gas valves, kind of starting with the earlier gas valves all the way up to say a three-stage gas valve. So you have a combination gas valve here, you have a pilot ignition gas valve, you have a 120 volt uh, smart valve right here, you have a direct ignition instead of a pilot ignition. And here you have a two-stage direct ignition gas valve. Here you have a three-stage uh, direct ignition gas valve. You really want to be aware of what you're looking at once you open up that cover on the gas furnace. And if you are unaware of one or multiple of these versions, those are the ones that you want to target and you want to start studying and look at. 
you know, you, know, you can look at them uh, on YouTube. You can, you can just type it up in, in your search engine and read up on them. You can do some manufacturer training. So you just want to be aware of what you may run into so that you are an effective troubleshooter out in the field and that you're safe as well. So here is a bunch of different pressure switches. So here's a single port, here is a two port, here's another version of a two port. And in this case, you have three terminals right here, one set of normally closed contacts and one set of normally open contacts. Once you lower the pressure on the spring side, the normally open contacts are gonna close and normally closed contacts are gonna open. Here you have another uh, metal type where it's just a single uh, port and you have two tabs. Here's a two port and you have three tabs right here. You're also gonna notice a little tiny hole right here. That's a atmospheric port. None of the sides of the pressure switch are fully sealed you're always gonna have a tiny, tiny little port in order to, when, when you uh, turn the power off to a gas furnace or the inducer motor loses power, both of these chambers right here should quickly go back to atmospheric pressure so that the pressure switch can open up the contacts again. So here is just uh, several control boards. So here we have a integrated furnace control board. And since you don't see these large black uh, blocks here, the, the direct current relays, this one is for uh, ECM inducer motor and ECM uh, blower motor. This particular one right here, is, this is just a standard IFC. And you can tell that because it just has these switches right here. So this switching mechanism right here is for your air conditioning and heat blower speeds. And then here, this little black box is going to be allowing power to the inducer motor. Over here, you just have a fan timing control board. And here you have an ignition control module. So you're just gonna wanna know what the difference is between these things. And here's just a picture of a dual water combinometer with a pump. This is the SDMN6, and it has the pump tap right here in the middle, and then it has the uh, one right over here on the side. You want a dual water combinometer. Regardless of whether you have one with a pump or not for checking pressure switches, you're gonna wanna have a dual water combinometer, not only for checking gas pressure and your water column measurement at your pressure switch, but also for airflow as well. So you're gonna want static pressure uh, tips or probes, basically. You have a little magnet here and you can insert this into the, the airstream and you're, you're measuring your static pressure. So if you have a high total external static pressure, uh, you're gonna either have a problem on either the return side or the supply side, whichever one is higher. You're really gonna wanna have this tool in order to do multiple types of diagnosing on a furnace. You're gonna to wanna to have a multimeter. So a digital multimeter with an AC amp clamp, you're gonna to wanna to have it be able to read capacitance for testing capacitors. You're gonna to wanna to be able to read uh, microamps for direct current, and you want it to be true RMS. Uh, you're gonna want jumper wires, so alligator jumper wires. You're gonna have also, uh, you're gonna want probably magnet jumpers to be able to jump inside the, the thermostats. And so the magnet will hold it in place. It has got little neodymium magnets. Then you're gonna want a door switch magnet as well. So you're not gonna to wanna to play around with tape every time. And you can get magnets, like free magnets right out of like a microwave if you want, like a scrap microwave, but you can buy the little flat neodymium ones uh, that will sit, sit in there even when you put the furnace door back on. But I like the larger magnets this way. I remember and know that that magnet's still in there. It's not allowing the door to fully go on there. Uh, but anyway, you could have a multitude of those, but you're gonna want a magnet to hold the furnace door switch in the closed position mechanically. You wanna have a combustion analyzer. This is the residential model. So you're gonna wanna have that in order to set your gas pressure and to test if you have maybe a crack in the heat exchanger, if you're doing a LP conversion from natural gas, or you're just, you know, you're just commissioning a new furnace. So you're gonna wanna have a combustion analyzer. Uh, it will be good to have a carbon monoxide detector so that you can have that on your body. If you're going into an equipment room, you don't know if you're just breathing in a lot of carbon monoxide while you're there. So that's kind of more of a, a danger thing. You could also be putting this over at the supply registers and then you can turn the furnace on. Hey, is, does my carbon monoxide level reading rise You know, while the furnace is running? And that would indicate that, hey, there's probably a crack in the heat exchanger or the heat exchanger has pulled apart at the, uh, right where the heat exchanger meets the, the one plate at. It could be that. It could be a multitude of different things. The other thing is you don't wanna be um, trying to utilize that 
at a supply register, like say near the kitchen, where you may have a little bit of carbon monoxide from the cooking appliances. But really, if you're going to tell somebody they have a crack in the heat exchanger, you want to be able to visually find it. You're going to want a, uh, a video scope in order to do that. You may go through the heat limit sensor in the plenum area next to the heat exchanger. You could take that out and you could look in there. You could drill a hole up in the uh, just a flat metal plate near the, the evaporator coil and look down there. You could do several things as far as trying to locate it. It is hard. You could stick it in through after you take the, the burner tubes off. You could stick it uh, through there inside the heat exchanger itself if it's cooled down. You do really want to get a visual picture for the building owner, if at all possible, in order to really show them that they have a crack in the heat exchanger. And it is hard. I get it. This is a uh, ST4 and we have two uh, K-type temp sensors. And so with this, you can uh, take a zip screw out of the return and supply. You can then uh, measure your delta T. You can measure your temporize for your gas furnace. You want to make sure that your temporize is not increasing, 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 meaning that your blower speed is too low or you're overfiring. So that's important to have. So once again, you can just slip these right inside of a, a zip screw hole. And then just when you're done, you can just put your zip screw back in. Your TechMate Pro for being able to troubleshoot ECM variable speed blower motors. Once again, if it's an ECM multi-speed or constant torque uh, blower motor, those are a lot easier to troubleshoot. And I've got uh, plenty of videos on ECM blower motor troubleshooting. So just look up AC Service Tech ECM troubleshooting or just AC Service Tech ECM blower you know, and that'll take you to those videos on YouTube. I hope this video helped you. And uh, if you want to learn more about HVAC, make sure to go to our website over at acservicetech.com. We also have a, a air conditioning book, the refrigerant charging and service procedures for air conditioning. So we've got that, a thousand question workbook, quick reference cards, but I just wanted to kind of give you just a general idea of some of the components you may run into in gas furnaces. And this is not a all-inclusive list either. There's other things like a, a mercury uh, sensor. There's a three-wire ignition. There's all kinds of different combinations and things that you can run into in the field and I just want you to be aware and so that you can kind of start to learn and plug those holes, those knowledge holes. Hope you enjoyed yourself and we'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.